fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I am Al Warren and David Rose Martino. <laughs> I'm not. See, I wasn't sure if you knew what I was going to say there. See? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I had you on That's edge. crazy. Uh, well, I'm, I'm always I'm, on edge. I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just strange. Uh, been been quite, quite a day. Uh, two weeks down, still with COVID, still battling the battle, and uh, I think I'm fight. winning. I think I'm winning. It just seems, right. to, it just seems to be nothing different. Actually, this last week's sort of just stayed the same. It's really weird. Uh, I'm waiting for change, but well, at least it's not worse. Yeah, that's that's true. You know, <laughs> it's true. It's not worse. It's not better. It's just there, which yeah. I guess that can happen. Um, so, you know, I keep drinking my uh, Gatorade Zero with no sugar. There you go. <laughs> get myself hydrated and energized, and then, uh, <laughs> oh, it's crazy, but it doesn't matter what I try to eat, it, 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 nothing tastes. Oh, that must be weird. That is so weird, because all it is is texture, because you mm. can't smell it or taste it, so you can have cereal, or you can have anything, and it's all the same. Wow. <laughs> it's just bizarre. <laughs> Coffee, there's no flavor. It's like It's like hot water. Well, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, eating pastries and donuts and stuff. Yeah, you can't no. taste it. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, okay. Yeah, so I won't know I'm doing it, right? Yeah, no. I'm, well, I, no. I mean, it's a good time to diet. Yeah, I think do. that's. I've been doing that for a couple of months. I've been doing no pastries and no no sugar as much as I can. So, you've been good. I've been really good. You yeah. know, I'll be a bone rack soon. <laughs> Anyway, well, um, so now today we have um, a little different kind of writer. It's not a crime fiction or anything like that. This is a, a true crime story. This is a nonfiction. And um, so it's, it's kind of a heart-wrenching story um, about the murder of a uh, professor. And um, he was an author, too. And um, we've got his uh, mother on, and we're going to be talking about her new book called Unva the Unveiling, and it's a mother's reflection on murder, grief, and trial life. And this is quite the story. So um, let's welcome Ruth Markell. Thank you for being here. What a pleasure to be here. I'm so sorry to hear about your condition. I just hope you get better, and maybe by next week's show, you'll uh, you'll be hopping around. But yeah, it's, t it's tough when you get sort of uh, tied down with COVID, and it doesn't, it lingers. The lingering is the worst part. But I'm really happy to be here today and to talk about the book and uh, the story. So I'll let you ask the questions, and I'll be glad to tell you everything. Okay. Well. Well. Yeah. This is quite the story. Um, um, let's. Let's. First of all, it's about your son, and he was murdered, and that was in uh, 2014. Um, so let's start with a little bit about who your son was and who you and your family are and kind of your, your background so we get a context on the family. Thanks so much. Yeah, so it's a regrettable story. Uh, my son, Dan Markell, became known as the Slain Professor in Florida. And unfortunately, I have a new identity as, of, as the mother of the Slain Professor in Florida. But let me tell you a little bit about Dan. So um, we are Canadian, because a lot of people can't realize that Dan is such an American story. But we are, we are Canadian. Dan is uh, born in Montreal until he lived in Montreal until he was five years old. And then we moved to Toronto. The whole family moved uh, in the mid-70s. And, uh, and Dan was, when he was younger, everybody always asked me, was he so studious? Was he the, so this? And actually, he was Dennis the Menace until he was about, uh, I would say, five, six years old. 
And then he really got serious. And um, as he went through high school, he was interested at one point to be a rabbi, then the stock market, and much later on, like the law, where he acclaim, was, where he's very acclaimed. Uh, but it, his um, while he was in Canada in high school, Dan decided that he's going out to go to university. He had only three choices, which was Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. And that's very hard for Canadian to do, and especially in the period of the 70s um, and early, you know, early 80s. Uh, and what happened was that he said he's, he's just going, he's not even enrolling in a Canadian university. So Phil, his father, said, Dan, come on, you have to appease me. One Canadian university. Anyway, Dan, Dan got into Harvard and he loved it. So his track sort of of his pathway of his career went like this. He went to Harvard undergrad. He then went and did a year in Israel. And then he went to Cambridge, England, um, University of Cambridge, Cambridge. And he got another uh, master's degree. He went back to Harvard Law School and he clerked, you know, the pretty much the high path of ending up at, either in academics or in Washington or whatever. And and sure enough, he did end up in Washington. And when he uh, his first job after he graduated Harvard Law and finished clerking was in a boutique law firm in in Washington that only did appellate work to the Supreme Court. So he was probably exactly where he wanted to be. And while he was there, um, there was a, uh, a young woman. Her name was Wendy Adelson. She lived in, uh, in um, Florida, in Miami area. She was seven years younger. And she wanted to be uh, an intern for a short period of time in Washington. So as she was getting ready to have her internship, she went on a J Day, Jewish dating service, uh, with with her mother, who picked out Danny. So her mother's name is Donna, and she picked out Danny as the candidate for her to date. So this was sort of um, a beginning of a relationship while he was there. But before he even got serious with Wendy, he uh, started something called Prof's Log. So it's P R A W F S Log B L A U G. And this became known as the major professor blog and student blog for, le for legal, uh, legal practice, legal interests in 2005. And what's interesting, it was so early for social media and starting a blog, just to put it in perspective, Facebook only became public to anybody who had an email in 2006. So his, his students explained to me once this groundswell about his his death from his murder was was really, really huge. And that was one of the reasons because he was so big on uh, social media. Anyway, Dan and Wendy uh, dated uh, while they were in Washington. They later uh, got married in 2006. And Dan decided since she had so many years left to finish law school, that he would um, become a professor at Florida State University. So she could ba basically move to Florida, let her finish her studies, and he would then um, you know, become an academic, so to speak. So that's kind of a bit of his history in terms of his professional profile. Well, so, so when he, um, because Wendy's kind of involved in the whole thing and eventually married him, what, what was the relationship with, your son and Wendy like, like at, when they got together and they got married and stuff like that. And how did you see the relationship? When they first, you know, when, when they first got married and prior to that, you know, we're dealing now, you know, this is a little bit unlike some parts of Canada, you know, where many people go and they go to university, they come back to their hometown, like, which is very common, in, you know, Montreal, Toronto and, and certain places, the States is less common, you know, you go away and you meet your your sort of new friendships and you from where you studied and you keep up your old ones, but you don't have a chance from the family point of view when somebody meets your your adult child, meets somebody, it's not like you see them every single day. So you haven't got the same, you know, root exposure that you would. But when they started, they were, you know, he didn't it wasn't the day one fall in love for Dan, but it, it actually grew in that period of time when she was in Washington. 
And it was, it was a, you know, an, a nice start. It was a nice uh, starting relationship. And there was no reason to ever think that in the early part uh, that there was going to be any major difficulties. And the difficulties that did come were later. So uh, the children were born in, um, in 2009 and, and, and 2010. And one of the things where um, Dan had started to have strong Jewish identity when he was 13, 14, and wanted, um, you know, the family to have some kind of, you know, customs, Jewish customs for holidays and programs and so forth. And they had an agreement that the children, once they were, you know, kind of preschool age or school age, or the household would become kosher, particularly for the children in their upbringing. And, and that meant many times in Jewish homes, people are kosher inside their home, which means they don't eat the, um, bacon, they don't eat pork, they don't mix milk and meat, but the, and they adhere to certain dietary uh, restrictions. And, um, and Wendy and Dan had that initial agreement, and when they went to the daycare, when the boys were very young, uh, they would bring tofu products. Like So the, the other children were having a hot dog. They had a hot dog too, but it, it, was, made, it was made from tofu. And that was really the, um, you know, I would say the distinction only between them. But then there is another problem, which was started to happen very young, uh, which was Wendy's mother, Donna, would come into the, to the daycare and tell the daycare people, just give the kids the regular food and so forth. They didn't really listen too much. And before you know it, Donna and Harvey, that's Wendy's father, were taking the kids to McDonald's and letting them have cheeseburgers. So cheeseburgers was really a no-no. A, the, the meat is not kosher, but you're putting meat, uh, milk product with meat. So that was like a real sabotage to Dan's interest in having some religious stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, strange, you know. Um, so now, how many children did they two, have? Two boys, very close. Very close together in age. So now, um, how long were they together before the murder happened? They were together. So they, they here's how they, they, uh, they got married in 2006. The murder happened in July 2014. So what happened to create this real negative environment, let's call it this extreme negative environment to commit a murder, uh, was that um, Donna, Wendy's mother, as I mentioned, had two problems with this whole setup. One was that she really um, sabotaged any of this sort of religious, I wouldn't even call it observance, but the idea of a strong identity. And the second one was when they were there, after Wendy completed um, her law degree and had the two children, Donna and Harvey, her family, lived in South Florida. Okay, They lived in Coral Springs. And Wendy and Danny were in Tallahassee. And Donna had decided that uh, this was too far. She wanted the kids closer to home. And basically, that really started to, you know, how do I say it? I don't want to use the word dagger in a relationship, but it was continuously probing it, right? And, and eventually, Wendy herself felt uh, stifled in Tallahassee. And what happened was they could have moved together and Danny was always willing to go anywhere. Initially, Wendy said she would be interested in Washington, but that later changed and she was only interested in going back to South Florida. Uh, so in the period of waiting, there was really um, a very, very difficult stretch. They tried to resolve it, but it didn't work. And it was a there was a terrible separation and the divorce happened in July, 2013. Now, prior to the divorce, see, here's where there was a lot of courts involvement. Prior to the divorce, um, Wendy, and but it was done as initiation, signed to try to get a petition through the court that Wendy and the two children could go visit, because they had joint custody, but go live, I should say, with her mother in uh, South Florida. The judge threw it out in 2013. And she said, at no time when you have two loving parents, they're both involved here, they both have employment, there's no reason for me to uh, even consider that they go live with the grandparents and the, the ex, so to speak. And she not only threw it out, she told them they could never bring it up again. 
So here was already they're starting to get the feeling that they're boxed in right against the wall and, and they're getting even more stuck there. And that was 2013. And, and also the actual final divorce was then. At the same time, in the 2013 to 2014, particularly in 2014, Donna started to tell the children that your father, you know, wants to take her, their, her sunshines away. And she badmouthed him. And at that point, Danny went to the court to discuss parental alienation. You know, like if you're badmouthing. And he wanted when um, Donna to be able to visit as frequently as she wanted, but it should be supervised because of what she was telling the kids. So this really heightened, you know, the backdrop to the feeling that um, they were stuck. And, and, you know, Don in particular was getting much more, much more sort of caged in. And, uh, and then there was a murder, July 18th, he was shot. And July 19th, which is most unfortunate, he died like from the period of 11 a.m. to the next day, so to speak, uh, he died. Um, I just wanted to go back for a second. I was just, I was just curious if um, Wendy's side, were they Jewish as well? or Yes, they were. That's a good question. So they were Reformed Jewish. Uh, you know, like we have a continuum of kind of how observant you have to be and so forth. But they were, they were definitely Jewish faith. They knew, they knew these practices. They didn't have to be observant or they didn't, they didn't have to, you know, let's call it comply to it and so forth. But I, I think what was really uh, in Donna's initiation, because she later on wrote Wendy these emails, you know, to try to provoke Danny to let them, you know, live in South Florida, to bring them up Catholic. It was all a provocation, really a provocation and sabotage. And, uh, you know, and of course, Wendy at that point never introduced that idea to Danny that if she didn't, if they couldn't move to South Florida, that she would bring the kids up Catholic. But Donna, there's all these emails uh, that Donna has sent, and they're all part of evidence. So now let's talk about the the murder itself. So what, what do we know happened during that murder? Okay. Okay, so here's, here's what we know. There's actually the major lead came from a neighbor next door, J- James Diger, and he saw what was then a green or white Prius leaving the house. That was the good news. They, they had something that they could, um, how do I say, track. It took them a long time, and the Tallahassee Police Department really did an excellent job. Uh, if you ever want to think Big Brother is watching you, remember the book 1984? Yeah. Yeah. Well, all of the um, bus systems, the cameras from buses track the car. The, they have in Florida like a, a sun pass um, toll. You know, when you leave one area to the other, the cameras from the streets, uh, all of all of the cameras of the day of the murder, the gym and where the children went to um, uh, what do you call preschool. Then and what's amazing is the police, um, the cell phone towers from where everybody is. So let me tell you where this is eight years later, where now we're into hacking and we understand. But eight years ago, like this was dramatic. So this is a data driven case. And they were able to, after two years of waiting, they arrested Sigfredo Garcia, who was the shooter. And they arrested another man. His name is Luis Rivera, who was the driver. And also later on, they brought in another woman called Catherine McBanawa. Um, maybe talk about the event itself. So how, where was he shot? How was he shot? Like what, what sort of transpired there? They followed it. So Danny's routine, his daily routine, when when um, he had the children, because uh, at that point, remember, they're already uh, divorced and they have different days for custody. So his daily routine, uh, even without custody, but when he had custody specifically, was when he had the children. I shouldn't say custody, he had custody, but the child care arrangement. When he had um, the children, um, he would, his first, visit would be to go to the preschool where they were and not only drop them off but he often like went in for breakfast there and he spent some time with the children he was an amazing father I should tell you I'm happy it came up in this part but he loved those kids so much that his house had if you can picture a big open area 
he put it in a closed line from one end of the living room area to the other, and he hung their artwork. So this this was a preschool home like no other, and he participated at that level at the preschool. But his routine would be after he was finished at the preschool, whether having breakfast with all the kids, he would then go to the gym. And this was pretty much his regular routine. And they followed him from the gym uh, to his house. Okay, so now they have the tracking of all the Prius. The Prius was at the preschool. The Prius went to the gym and the Prius came to his home. And, and luckily for me, I often speak to Danny when he's just driving home from either work or, or, or the gym. And he had to make a phone call because I would, uh, just five minutes, as he's sort of getting closer to his neighborhood, he says, look, my, I got to get off. I have to make this other phone call. And I'm thrilled that God at least had, this is a terrible story, but if I would have heard the shot, I don't know if I would be able to talk to you today. Anyway, I was not on the phone. At the time, the Prius uh, followed him into his driveway. They never went in the house, and they shot him right in the car. And and the neighbor heard it, and also this person on the phone with him, they called um, right away, you know, the dispatch, the emergency uh, line and dispatch and so forth in Tallahassee. So that was really the event. And then he, he was shot 11 a.m. on a Friday, we weren't contacted. They couldn't find us right away because we we're in Canada. They called us about 5.30 in the evening, and they told us that he was shot and he's not going to make it, and he would die approximately 2 a.m., which is exactly really what happened. It was ter- terrible for, for us. And, um, and, you know, like this is the sad part, the terrible part. So we are homicide survivors today, which has a category – related to grief all on its own. It's the psychological impact of sudden violent death on the family, and it and it's, it's poignant. So let's go back to the people that were arrested then. So what, what, what were you saying about what we knew about them? Okay, so what we, we didn't know anything for two years other than they, uh, a year after the police had a big conference and they told us they had a car. That, that was the first part. The big breakthrough was uh, May 25th, 2016, and that was when Zafredo Garcia, the shooter, he was arrested and he was convicted in September of 2019. We had a lot, a lot of hearings. They were postponed and the trial life is terrible. That's what the book is about. So the book is called The Unveiling. You know, a mother, a mother's reflection on murder. And then this is the murder I'm describing, grief and the trial life. And um, he was uh, just just recently, I mean, 2019, uh, where he was convicted. They had the death uh, penalty on him, but he wasn't sentenced with that. His buddy, Luis Rivera, who was the driver of the car, he plea bargained. So this was very significant. He plea bargained and he brought in Catherine McBanawa, who is the go-between and between um, Garcia, Rivera, now, and the Adelson family. So she was just, just convicted May 27th of 2022. And she's con- convicted of uh, life, life and also conspiracy and solicitation of murder. So she was convicted on the basis that she was getting the money from the, from the family and bringing it to Garcia and Rivera and herself, like how she was paid. And that dealt with the three of them. Now, just recently, the when the affidavit for um, Garcia was read, unexpectedly, they kind of revealed the other two people, which was uh, Rivera and McBanawa, but they also said that Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson, that's, um, Charlie was Wendy's brother, her brother a little bit older than her, and Wendy and Donna, sorry, her mother, who were unindicted co-conspirators, but they didn't ever charge them before. For the first time since that happened, uh, Charlie Adelson was just, just charged April 2022, prior to McBanawa's conviction. A lot happened in 2022, really, a lot. And that's kind of where we are. Three people are in prison, one person is in jail, 
His trial will be in 2023, probably spring. That's Charlie Adelson. This is quite a process, and I know I've covered other cases that have kind of been like, well, everyone's a little different, but have taken a lot of time, several years. Um, what's the process like for someone like you? Terrible. It, I call this, um, well, first let me, let me tell you a little bit about why I wrote the book. Okay. This is going to yeah. really show you what, what the story is. The book is called The Unveiling, A Mother's Reflection on Murder, which we're talking about now, Grief, and Trial Life. Now, the unveiling is very significant because in the Jewish tradition, when you have a um, funeral, you know, you have the grave site. And then a few months later, we put a tombstone on top of it with an inscription. But when the inscription is written on the tombstone, we cover it. And there's another ritual, another service, and it's called the unveiling. So it's a, a process where family and friends, and depends how many people you want to invite, get together to really, um, you know, focus on the finality of the person's death. Okay, so that's really a uh, part of how we deal with it. And for me, that's when the deep, deep grief process started. So it's a very significant period in my journey of grief. Prior to that, I was in a daze. I was in a shock. I was sad. But this was like, you know, this the, the expression, the nail on the coffin, the last nail on the coffin, which was literally, in my case, like seeing the finality of it. So that's the one only reason, first, why I wrote the book, to talk about the grief process. Because anybody who's going through murder situations is a victim and has, you know, psychological implications as well. But the second reason, which is maybe more important, is to lift the curtain, to lift the veil and show the public what is it like to be in a victim experience, all right? Because this is really what people don't know. And, you know, you focus on who was arrested and what's the crime. And believe me, this is a very big a crime story, very well known. It uh, already had two, you know, two uh, programs, two two-hour programs on Dateline and NBC. There's a podcast over my dead body, which had over 10 million listeners. It's going to be maybe a um, an Apple TV series. So we were blessed with the, the privilege of the media, but nobody knows what's happening to this poor family, and we're suffering. And since, you know, the last few months, I don't have to tell you, the amount of school shootings in the States, it's horrific, right? Every time I hear, you know, a school shooting happening and I, I think to myself, oh my, here goes another family, right? You know, down the drain almost. And the same thing in Canada. We've had, um, you know, some, some large, when we do it here, we don't have it as frequently, but we've had some very large, you know, recent murders and stabbings. And we also have the, the issue with the indigenous families and, you know, and the remains of the children. So we have our own stories here. They don't quite, you know, create the same glamour. Uh, and this particular story is, you know, very glitzy. And it, you know, and one of the things is homicide, you know, doesn't discriminate. So there's families that have resources, there's poor families and so forth. So we are all suffering. So that is the grief. The trial life is what it's about. Yeah. And that's the whole experience of going through what I call the roller coaster lifestyle of life well I wouldn't call it a lifestyle but life experience you know where you have a hearing before we even had um, Garcia and McBanowitz hearing in 2019 I think we had nine cancellations and then we had to go through the um, the actual next set through the pandemic which was canceled totally like I even have a section in the book seeking justice in the pandemic which is almost impossible so we we're kind of continuously you know, living ups and downs, and and there's no opportunity to, let's call it, get a stable equilibrium, even although it's we're going to function at a bit lower level than before, because this is not a good story. But the point is, it's very disruptive, very disruptive, the trial life and this whole experience. Yeah, I guess there's probably a point, too, that until it's all finished, they're, they're, you're sort of stuck in a limbo, sort of. You're sort of still where you were a few years ago. Like, it's so slow and it takes so long that you, you can't really wrap it up, so to speak. 
No, that's true, 100%. And that's why I describe it as I say, I have this expression, closure is a word in the dictionary. You know, the two words that people will say is, you know, move on or, you know, like, or they don't say it actually because, yeah. you know, they, most people are very, very understanding and sympathetic. But sometimes when things are so lengthy, like this is, you know, people want to say something, all right, you know, kind of move on. But you can't move on because just to give you an example, um, Catherine McBanua was convicted in May. She then had afterwards, uh, she's appealing. Charlie Adelson was um, arrested in April. He just had an Arthur hearing uh, September 29th. Right. And then there was sentencing for Catherine. So even not the big, big trials, if you see where I'm going with this, yeah. the small stuff is also totally interfering, disruptive, and you cannot really, you know, get to a point where you can naturally take a breath because the next event is, is going to happen in the next month or so. So this is kind of where we are now. Like right now we're waiting for case management, which will happen in December of this year to tell us when um, the next trial will be, which will be early spring of 2023. So what, what it's hard. Yeah. So what, what can you do or what have you done to try and, um, let's say, live more normally. I mean, it's never going to be the same, of course, but is there things that you find that help you kind of get through? Yes, I'm going to tell you. So one of the things that happened, um, and this is an important part of the story today, uh, unfortunately, in 2016, when uh, the arrest started to happen, Wendy cut us off from seeing our American grandchildren, their name is uh, their names, I should say, are Benjamin and Lincoln. And at that point, we were shocked because that was our only tie to Danny, right? To, and they, they're tied to Dan's family. And we want to make it no matter what, that we never abandon the children. So what happened was we tried through our lawyers to, you know, get Wendy to reconsider, let us visit and so forth. And nothing ever happened. And then what then what I did do, so now I went from grief to advocacy and the grandparent issue, it tormented me. Like this, like talking about the trial life, I, I needed to do something. And I live in Canada, but I have the benefit of a lot of American uh, insightful friends. And one of them was our lawyer in New York. And he says, Ruth, you're going to have to write a bill. A bill. I'm sitting in Toronto. How am I going to ever write a bill in Florida? <laughs> and then... And then another one of my friends, these are all Americans, right? The American way, let's call yeah. it. You, you're going to need lobbyists. <laughs> so again, and then the lobbyist was interesting because when I really moved on that one, it was 2016. And then the lobbyist said, you know what? We're just going to have an election now. And uh, it doesn't pay because I need to know who's going to be in power to influence. Anyway, <laughs> 2019, after Garcia's trial, I'm in Tallahassee and this young woman comes over to me. And I could see she's Dan's age. She says, can I, and I'm, can I give you a hug? And I said, sure. Like, you know, like I, I saw that she's very engulfed in the story and so forth. And her name is Kath, Catherine Halpern Cyphers. And she says, what can I do for you? And I just blurted it. I'm sitting on it now for three years. I said, grandparent alienation. So, and that's a huge social problem on its own. And she says to me, done, done. This is October. And it just turned out that um, she uh, was part of and Today, she, she actually owns this media company, but she had worked for many years in the actual as a staffer in the legislature. So she knew all the contacts and so forth. And we put together, you know, this takes a village. And she did. She's the champion. And I'm certainly the strategic, the back part of it. But she did the, all of the front work. She, we got lobbyists. And in 2020, that's now, I'm 2019, October, where I meet her, 2020, she got already Senator Brandeis to pass this bill, potential, in the in the Senate, which it did. But we didn't have time to do it in the, um, the legislature. In 2021, so this is now try two, so to speak, we decided we'll work only on the language of the bill because that becomes critical. But then in 2022, we just passed um, the Grandparent Act, and it's basically, it's, it's called under the formal name, 
is HB 119, but it's called the Markel Act. It's informal. And it allows grandparents in very specific situations where one of the partners um, is deceased and it's possible the other person who survived, the other parent of the child, is involved and it's either there's civil or there's criminal findings against them. And this bill was just, just passed, signed, I should say, in June 24th by Governor DeSantis. So this is what I've been working on for the last, you know, few years. And it's, and it's really been a, an amazing experience because something positive, right? You go from grief. This is what's also the book is about from grief, you know, to promise to outcome. And we had a really good outcome. And this is unusual. So the advocacy issues are the things that made it work for me. And I say this, you know, to any parents, and particularly parents who've lost their children, probably to violence, you know, and I'm so sensitive to these families, they think about their child, they think about, oh, should I make a foundation? How can I memorialize them? And my message to them is really, it's never too late. You know, don't, and I have a new saying, this is one of my sayings, I've become a uh, phrase person. <laughs> Don't get lost in the loss, L-O-S-S. And that's to anybody who's in grief. So we made it. We actually got legislation passed. And we actually, um, not using the legislation, we had a visit in April 2022. So this 2022 has been such a breakthrough in this case. Really uh, a positive year, and I hope it continues. So are you planning on pursuing that legislation now and getting rights to your grandchildren? Well, we had a visit. I don't know if we need to use it. Uh, first of all, it doesn't exist. We have the rights to use uh, the legislation. So right now, there's not a finding uh, against the mother of the children, Wendy Adelson, right. either civil or criminal. Now, civil Civil suits, wrongful death suits, as I think you might know, or the audience, I should explain it. That's in the family. That's that is in the capacity of the family, right? This is not. It's like O.J. Simpson and all these other cases where they didn't get, um, you know, like Bill Cosby on maybe on the criminal stuff, but the civil suits work, right? right. So that's in our hands. We didn't use it yet, uh, but it, it's close enough if we need to use it. But at the moment. I think that, um, you know, maybe Wendy, through the advice of her lawyer and others, has sort of created a little bit of a room for an opening so that sort of not that it prevents us from using it, but it, it just makes it easier to not have to go that route to see the children. Yeah, yeah. It's a, we, it's a, we had one visit so far. Well, that's a good thing in a way. It's sort of, it, it, it's a little bit more promising, as you said, right? There's there's more of a future, maybe. How how was the visit with the grandchildren? Then did it turn out good? Was it? Uh, were... It was amazing. I have to tell you, we were nervous a little bit, like we haven't seen the kids for six years, yeah. and you couldn't have planned it better. My Canadian grandchild, the youngest, is sixteen, and I said to her, you know, I said, what do you think? Can we ask them to give us a hug or whatever? She said, yeah. And what I what happened was it just worked out so naturally. They were dry, walking towards us from the parking lot, you know, and we went over to greet them and we said, hey, can we give you a hug? And both both kids, I mean, two kids, they're adolescent kids. You don't get a hug normally sometimes. Right. They both they both hug each of us. I mean, it's like back and forth and, you know, forth and back. And we had a very an amazing visit. It was not long, but it was good. How much experience did you have in, in this whole system? Like, did you have any any legal experience or anything? Did you, did you Have you ever gone through any of this stuff or had to work through this? Sort of? Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on myself. Okay, so I'm um, born in Montreal, living in Toronto. And I was, my first degree, I have several, my first degree, though, was in, in social work in Montreal. And I became interested in the 60s. Now, so this is why it's relevant not in just doing clinical work, but very, very young in my career, really to look at resources, reallocation of services, administrative stuff. Nobody, no doctor, no psychologist, no social worker. You want to do that stuff? This is what all the hospitals have to do today, right? This is the 60s. So I shot up the ladder because I, and I did policy work. I did advocacy work. 
My career only helped me with the grandparent stuff, even although I'm social work trained, as they would call it. Um, it doesn't deal with the grief, but it did help me with all of the sort of understanding of how to maneuver policy and, and, and legal. And then I went for an MBA. I was one of the first women in University of Toronto, mature women. So I was 33 years old. I was in the daytime class, not evening, with the children of uh, 10 years old and five years old at the time. And I wanted, I needed at the time, because I was really moving into very large administrative positions, and I needed to basically uh, have, I needed finance, I needed operations management, I needed calculus, I needed the hardcore business stuff, because I was buying mainframes for, you know, very large healthcare systems. And don't forget, Canada is the public sector, right? So when we're doing yeah. something, it is huge. It's very different than the States. And as a result of the, the, that initiative, I started my own consulting firm. And this was in the late 70s. And, um, and after that, uh, people came to me. Uh, this is my 10th book, by the way. So in the early 80s, um, all of the large publishers like Penguin and so forth said, look, Ruth, you have this leadership experience. You have this management experience. Write some books for women. And that's what I did. So I have a good background, solid, in really the preparation for, you know, definitely for advocacy. And even although I'm trained and I practiced for a few years, I didn't stay in clinical work long. I have to say, and then later on, I did disaster planning for hospitals and emergency preparedness. That flies out the window when you're dealing with a violent death. I have to say that maybe at some point, you know, you understand, you know, the criminal system in a different way. But I'm talking about really the personal, personal stuff. You know, it doesn't it doesn't really prepare you. But there's a lot of other things that. You know, certainly I conceptually can grasp all of the legal framework. I'm not trained in it. I'm not a lawyer or anything. And I have to learn all the time. Look, the evidence in this yeah. case, this is my new land mantra now, learning evidence, right? So there's, there's federal evidence because why? All of the material, the Tallahassee Police Department cannot go to South Florida in the same way, right? So the FBI is, plays a huge part because... All of the um, offenders were in South Florida. So the FBI, this is federal evidence. This is now I'm giving you my, my learning lesson. Then there is the state evidence, which allows, and the state of Florida does have the death penalty. And then there's conspiracy evidence, right? So what's on the wiretapping? What are they allowing in? Which is very big in this case, uh, all of the conspiracy evidence. So this I'm learning as I'm going along. I'm not telling you that I'm any kind of a lawyer or anything related, but, it, you know, a little bit you you learn because you need to know it and, and to understand it. So I had some preparation, I would say, mostly for the advocacy work, although I had the skills to do disaster planning. That, like, was not as, um, how do I say it? It, then, it doesn't come to you when you're dealing with violent death. It's too personal. At the end, end of the day, and now that you've been through so much of it, and... Um, what would be the key advice that you give to someone that's um, perhaps in this same predicament, say, having the same experience, but at the beginning of it? What What is it that you would tell them to do that you didn't know? Well, a couple of big things. You need a network. Okay, you're not going to do this alone. And on the very personal level, I would say when you're in shock and there's a tendency maybe to isolate yourself, a good friend of mine said, her, unfortunately, her son committed suicide. And she said to me, take all the calls at the beginning because you're not, she didn't continue to get them. I am very grateful. I did continue to get them. But the point that I'm really talking about here is you might not want to take any of those calls at the very beginning, but you, you need that support. So even, you know, even it's for minutes or whatever, or you have somebody who buffers for you and explains for you. But really, the earlier you could start your personal coping, let's call it, that is not self-isolating. That's the be that's the most important at the beginning, right? That's the real, from the shock point, you have to, and then you need information. Like if we didn't have the quality of information that we have, 
available to us and, and to be able to use it. Now, we had a lot of privilege. Um, you know, a lot of Danny's friends came through. You know, they're all lawyers. It's not that you need only lawyers. You don't. I went initially to the clergy. You know, until till you go out, and I'm a, I'm a believer in anything of uh, any therapy model, whatever you want to use, you should use it if you, if you want to benefit from it. Like, in other words, you need it all. It takes a village to make it through and, and so forth. So that's my first thing. Don't isolate yourself. And so forth. And then at a certain point, I think you have to take the little steps forward. Let's say, like, I never had to stay in bed. Most of my friends tell me they would never get out of bed if they had my life. But at a certain point, take those small steps. And that's when I say, don't get lost in the loss, L-O-S-S, because it's time consuming and it's psychologically consuming. And it really can take away your energy. And it makes it very hard for all the family members as well. So those are the really, the, the mental health question is important. And also, you know, getting as much coaching as you can uh, about the criminal system. In my book, The Unveiling, I have a murder coach, which is a terrible story, but it was so beneficial to me. And I describe it. There was another Canadian story of the murder of Adam Anhang from Winnipeg and his father. He reached out to me. The whole book has all about how he explains to me at certain points, going in front of the jury, doing this, doing that, using the media. And the book, the, the middle part of the whole book is trial life. And it really, really describes the kind of intervention. So he helped me and I say to any family, get as much help as you can. Really, that's the most important point. Plus, extend yourself to and take the small, small steps, but take them. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't really have to, you know. Um, you know, in this system, it, it should be set up more for the victim, in a sense, and, and victims and survivors of, of crimes like this. Um, you shouldn't have to play to media and work the media or work the, you know, the, the system, so to speak. You shouldn't have to, if that makes sense. There is good, via- look, I'm going to tell you, there is very official, let's call it, and good, Victim liaison, all right? Like both, in my case, the Tallahassee Police Department had an excellent social worker who started from the beginning. The state attorney's office has a victim liaison, which we work with a lot. Now for the appeals, there is, but they're not as active because the family has less, um, in the Florida appeal process, has really less input. But having said that, you still need a lot of interpretation and and you still need a lot of terms like, you know, when you get when the juror gets their jurors, I should say, get their descriptions, they really um, in you know a very short period of time have to read through all of the different you know legislative pieces and the criminal law and so forth about the verdicts, the prosecutors, the witnesses, you know, and so forth. I think that um, there's some room in legal training not so much in the prosecutor level, but from the defense teams uh, to have more sensitivity to compassion. I think that's the biggest issue here. Sensitivity to compassion. Yeah, it's pretty. So um, the pandemic itself was kind of really hard too. that that two years was must have been terrible for trial and, and all of this court stuff. It was that was a disaster, to be honest with you, because you see, we just were moving 2019, which was September. Right. We had just just had the um, the Garcia trial. And and here we were. There should have been, you know, the next level of momentum and everything kept on being, you know, continued or postponed. The word continuance is like a legal term, but it's it, it sounds like it should be, post, you know, continued to me means you're having it right. But. Continuance means canceled. Not hap- not, it's a non-happening, right? They're taking off that date. And um, the point is, we had so many. And then we also had a situation uh, initially and then through the pandemic to later, both of the defense lawyers, and they're young, had cancer. So they weren't willing, even when the courts opened up, they weren't really willing yet to risk, um, you know, any... Uh, opportunities, so to speak, for disease, and that even was further delayed. So it, it was it was horrific. The the only way that I personally used the pandemic was to write, 
Okay, so this was the opportunity for me to basically write the book during the pandemic because I was stuck and Canada had very strict rules, very, very strict rules. And that was one of the um, opportunities. I'm stuck in the house, literally. And that's when I when I just said, okay, that's it. I'm writing the book. I wanted to do it anyway. And, and that kind of worked in its own way for my benefit because then I had a job to do, which I like distractions. In this kind of a situation, you need a lot of distractions. Yeah. And when you look back at the book now, are you happy with the way it came out? Yes, I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, it ended... The book writing itself actually ended the story in 2021. I did an addendum at the very last page of the book about 2022, right? Because that was really when two big breakthroughs. And the amazing thing, just to put it in perspective, on April 20th, we went to visit the children in Miami. We went for the day and um, we're coming back and we're at the airport. And I get a call from the FBI. Did you visit the kids? Yes, everything went well. The next morning, 6 a.m., I'm, I'm, we, got, we only got into the house maybe 1 a.m. on the next day, on the 21st, and I get a call. Charlie Adelson is arrested. I, th I thought I'm dreaming. You know, <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, in 24 hours, the two biggest breakthroughs in the case really happened. And so, um, yeah, I'm very pleased about the book. I, I think the book has strong messages to other families. As specifically about seeking justice in the pandemic and the whole experience and the exposure. I think what the book is my, what my purpose was is really to show the public what is a family like? I mean, you have the glitz and the glamour. In this case has so much of it. And uh, what, what is really happening behind the scenes? And that I think I met the purpose of why my, my, what my goal was. And that's why I call it the unveiling, literally lifting the curtain of um, the whole experience to the family. How are the grandkids holding up? Well, they're, they're 13 and almost 12. In fact, 12 tomorrow is the second one. They're very close in age. And um, it's very much, uh, it's hard for us to know what they know. I'm going to tell you that we mm. don't have an idea of what they really understand. I don't, I, so I, you know, I, I, they're, they're on, if you meet them on a, you know, an interactional level, they were fine. But do I know how fine they really are? I don't. And I don't know really what they right. know. And I don't know when they're going to know it, right? So that's very much what is concerning to me right now. They're my biggest worry. They're my biggest worry, the grandkids. I'm sure. So um, let's talk about uh, contact and book and everything. So where can people buy the book? And how do you like people to contact you or do you like do you have a website do you do social media i do have a website yes and i'd be delighted to tell you my website is ruthmarkell.com and in the website there's an area where if it's media contact people can contact me there's another site that people should be familiar with who want to follow this case and that's another benefit that we had one of dan's friends jason solomon started something called justice for dan which is on social media, Twitter, and, and everything else. And it's and if you search it, let's say just Google it, it's Justice for Dan posts. Very, very simple and very, very easy. And um, the other thing, the book uh, can be purchased uh, through Amazon, through the, book, the big bookstores. I'm not sure what you have where you are, but Barnes & Noble has it. And if you just look on the internet and search The Unveiling and Mother's a mother's reflection on murder, grief, and trial life. And you could see all of the places where the book can be purchased. And of course, um, some people want it in a digital form. It's going to be out on, it is, I should say, out on Kindle and Kobo. And it's now even an audio book. So I think it's there. And I would love people to look at it. It's a, it's a very important story. It's a complex story. And, you know, the purpose really is of showing people what is it like for a family to go through this? What is it the grief experience look like? And what can be a positive outcome? And, you know, some of the people say to me, who do you admire? And what, you know, sort of who do you look up to? I'd like to say that we're moving in the direction of something like Mothers Against Drunk Driving. You know, look at the power of what they've done. And so there's room for people who are 
really feeling downtrodden, whatever it is to fight back. Uh, you know, there's been airline mishaps, all kinds of stuff that's gone on. And and just engage yourself because they say that it helps you with the healing of the trauma. And I think I think that's true. I do believe that. Well, fantastic advice. Great book. So the book we're talking about is called The Unveiling. It's a mother's reflection on murder, grief, and trial life. And uh, the author of the book has been our guest, Ruth Markell. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. And I hope you recover soon and uh, you just get better and go flying. (laughs) Well, I hope so. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.